on this chilly night, we are warmed by the friendships that we share. And I hope that no matter your faith tradition, you feel at home in this space. A space made all the more sacred by the presence of God in each one of you. Welcome to all, religious, civic, labor, business leaders, communities, friends, and family, parishioners from Chicago, Nebraska, South Dakota, Ohio, Virginia, and elsewhere. I'm especially pleased to honor our ecumenical leaders who are with us today, but also our civic leaders, Mayor Rahm Emanuel and Amy Rule, President Frank Weigel, Congressman Lipinski, Congressman and Mrs. Lipinski, labor leaders, and business. On the day Pope Francis invested new cardinals, he reminded us that instead of receiving an honor, we were accepting a greater responsibility, the responsibility of taking our place alongside him as he serves the needs of the universal church and indeed of the entire world. I am humbled by the outpouring of goodwill and support that so many have offered me on this occasion, people of faiths and people of none. I believe that they do so because they recognize that the naming of a cardinal for Chicago is also for them. That is why it is appropriate for us to come together this evening, to pause and reflect with the help of God's inspiration on what it means for Chicago to stand together and take its place among the great cities of the world and the singular responsibility that involves. Admittedly, while the insights I want to share this evening are informed by the readings just proclaimed from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, they share so much in common with the great religions of the world, and I pray that they will find a place in the hearts of all who seek truth. We first hear from the prophet Isaiah, who speaks to us of God's promise. Unlike our promises, God's word is always good. In fact, Isaiah tells us that God does not wait until the far distant future to keep it. God's promise is fulfilled now in our hearing. That is because what is promised is the grace to do things that we have never done before. It is a promise of a God who can make the desert bloom with abundant flowers, cause streams to burst from parched lands, and carve a pathway through the wilderness. The people of Isaiah's time are beaten down. They're spent in the face of inexorable complexities and the seemingly unsurmountable challenges from within and from without their borders. In the very telling of God's promise, they are invited to accept God's grace to chart a new future, to find new pathways unshackled from their present woes. Isaiah's words are also meant for us tonight, for us who suffer the daily onslaught of violence raging in our streets, who are paralyzed by intractable political stalemates and mistrust of one another that makes reasonable compromise, let alone sitting down and actually talking with one another, seem impossible. Isaiah dares us tonight to believe that God is ever calling us and gracing us to be imaginative, calling us to risk seeking a new way forward, to be bold, to put aside the false security of making our own convictions absolute. God's grace aims at awakening the aspirations for civic harmony and common good that lie deep within each of us. Let us pray tonight that our hearts will be stirred by God's promise, that we will not be afraid of God's creative grace, nor be afraid of one another. The sacred text tonight 
Also make it clear that those offered God's promise should see themselves as one people, a people on the move, knowing that together they have a journey to make, all the while helping one another along the way with heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another lovingly and forgiving one another. How true it is in life that fellow travelers seldom agree on everything. Maybe that's why God invented GPS. We come at life from different directions, reflective of the diverse cultural, language, faith origins, which define Chicago as an immigrant city. But this is not something to fear. This is not a weakness. This is our strength. This is our heritage. We also all walk at different paces with our own loads to carry. We have to be honest with each other that life is not an even playing field for some, especially when racism and bigotry, xenophobia, a fragile family structure and history a lack of opportunity in education and the workplace burdens so many of our neighbors, so many of our fellow travelers. There are also those among us who face unique challenges and uncertainties, as do the spouses and children of our first responders who say goodbye each and every workday with worry in their hearts. They fear for the safety of their loved ones not unlike the parents who are anxious about their children's safety in neighborhoods plagued by gun violence and marked by economic inequality and segregation. Surely the counsel that we hear from Paul tonight to bear with one another lovingly means finding ways to diminish the fears so many feel, if only by distancing ourselves from the tendency to fear each other by putting people in the us and them boxes. Finally, there is a word tonight for those who, like Jesus on the Sermon, Sermon on the Mount, stand in the high places of leadership. Many here tonight. This text has always been a touchstone for my service in the church as a bishop. A bishop, a word that means overseer. Jesus looks over the crowd. He doesn't criticize, nor express worry that the burden of leading is too heavy. For him, the poor, the weak, the mournful, the oppressed are not a burden, but they're a blessing. He uses words not to criticize, but to encourage, to remind people of the depths of God's grace in each one of them. In his homily for the investing of cardinals, Pope Francis spoke about the virus of animosity that so often infects society and especially our public discourse. Once unleashed, the virus spreads, becoming a sickness that weighs down the soul of a people where verbal violence becomes actual violence. Should we be so surprised that when adults deal contentiously with conflict, a young person is shot in a squabble over gym shoes? Leading responsibly, leading courageously, leading in love is not only about achieving positive results, it is also about the example we are giving to the next generation. And so how do we, as clergy, public servants, teachers, coaches, parents, want our children to behave, to resolve their conflicts? We should not forget that as we solve our problems and resolve our disputes today, all those we serve, and especially our youth, are watching us. What is required now, Pope Francis told business and political leaders yesterday, is not a new social compact in the abstract, but concrete ideas and decisive action which will benefit all people, 
and which will begin to respond to the pressing issues of our day. A good place to start is for all of us who are given the high ground of leadership to speak and to act in a way that gives people the hope to tap into the creative resources God continually gives us to speak and to act in a way that moves us forward together, to speak and to act with care because our children are watching us. Yes, tonight we gather not to pay honors or to praise any one person, but to recapture what it means for Chicago to stand together, to take its place among the great cities of the world. You can count on me in joining you with God's help in making that hope a reality. <laughs>